in the International Court of Justice, in the certain Iranian assets in the Republic of Iran and the United States of America, reported in the year 2023. The summary facts of the case. The disagreement dated back to 2016 when the United States Supreme Court upheld a judgment that held Iran financially responsible for terrorist attacks, including the 1983 Beirut Marine Corps barracks bombing, Hezbollah, a Shiite political movement and militia backed by Tehran, was responsible for the deaths of 241 American troops. Suing Iran for financial damages was one of few mechanisms that the United States could use to seek recompense for attacks. Iran had refused to comply with past judgments, so lawyers searched for Iranian assets frozen in the United States. U.S. courts plans to use the funds held by Citibank to compensate victims of Iran-sponsored terrorist attacks. Iran filed a lawsuit against the United States in the ICJ later in 2016. The judgment of the court. On March 30, Washington and Tehran both declared victory after the International Court of Justice ruled on disputed Iranian assets frozen by the United States. The top UN court rejected Iran's bid to unfreeze some $2 billion in central bank funds held in a Citibank account in New York but it also ordered the United States to compensate Iranian companies for illegally blocking other assets. On jurisdiction over the Central Bank of Iran, Bank Markazi, in the March 30th opinion, the court returned to the outstanding jurisdictional question and determined that it lacks jurisdiction over Iran's claims relating to alleged U.S. violations of the Treaty of Amity in relation to Bank Markazi. The treaty grants benefits only to nationals, natural persons, and companies. The United States successfully argued that Bank Markazi was not a company within the meaning of the treaty and therefore, Iran's central bank was not protected by the treaty. This jurisdictional determination was particularly significant because it covered assets of nearly $1.75 billion, representing most of Iran's overall monetary claims. In reaching its decision, the court paid particular attention to the nature of Bank Markazi's activities rather than its legal personality, separate from the government of Iran. Iran contended that Bank Makarzi's investment of dematerialized bonds issued on the U.S. financial market and subsequent management of proceeds from those 22 securities qualified it as a company under the treaty. The ICJ was unconvinced and ruled that the bank did not engage in a sufficient level of activities of a commercial character to be characterized as a company entitled to the treaty's protections. The court ruled that Bank Markazi's operations in the United States are part of the usual activity of a central bank and inseparable from its sovereign function. On failure to exhaust local remedies, the court rejected the United States' objection to admissibility based on Iran's failure to exhaust local remedies. Under customary international law, a state that initiates an international claim on behalf of its nationals based on diplomatic protection must exhaust local remedies before the claim can be heard. This requirement is also considered satisfied when there are no local remedies providing the injured persons with a reasonable opportunity to obtain redress. In this case, the court remarked that each time an Iranian entity sought to have federal statutory provisions set aside by U.S. courts because they were inconsistent with rights provided by the Treaty of Amity. 
The U.S. court routinely applied the federal law due to it being enacted after the treaty. Because of this, the court concluded that the Iranian entities had no reasonable possibility of successfully asserting their rights in United States court proceedings and rejected the United States' challenge to admissibility based on the failure to exhaust local remedies. The United States Defenses the International Court of Justice rejected three separate defenses invoked by the United States. First, it rejected the United States' contention that Iran had committed an abuse of rights by applying the Treaty of Amity to majors it considered to be unrelated to commerce. Secondly, the court next dismissed the United States' defense that its Executive Order 13599 blocking the property of the Iranian government and related financial entities fell into two carve-outs of the treaty, majors that regulate the production of or trafficking arms and majors that are necessary for a contracting party's essential security interests. The court disagreed that the executive order fell into either of these two exceptions. It found that the majors in the executive order only had an indirect impact on the production of and the trafficking arms by Iran. Additionally, the court ruled that the executive order was not necessary to protect the United States' essential security interests, noting that the justifications set out in the executive order itself were primarily financial rather than security considerations. And thirdly, the United States asked the courts to dismiss all claims brought by Iran under the Treaty of Amity on the grounds that Iran came to the court with unclean hands. The court noted it had never upheld that clean hands constitutes custom or general principle of law and that it considers the doctrine with caution. The International Law Commission, in its responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts, also declined to consider unclean hands as grounds for a preclusion of wrongfulness, noting it has been invoked principally in the context of the admissibility of claims before international courts and tribunals, though rarely applied. Despite its hesitancy to apply the doctrine, the court stated that even if it were to apply clean hands to the case, a nexus between the wrongful conduct imputed to Iran and its claims under the Treaty of Amity would be needed. The court determined this necessary nexus was missing and rejected the United States on clean hands defense. Having rejected these defenses, the court then turned to the merits of Iran's specific claims alleged violations of the Treaty of Amity, Article 3, Paragraph 1, and Article 4, Paragraph 1. Iran and the United States disagreed on the meaning of Article 3, Paragraph 1, of the treaty which provided for Iranian and American companies to have their juridical status recognized within the territory of each contracting party. In its 2019 judgment on preliminary objections, the ICJ understood juridical status as a company's own legal personality, sometimes existing as an entity distinct from its associated state. Article 4, paragraph 1 provides for fair and equitable treatment and prohibits the United States and Iran from taking unreasonable or discriminatory measures against each other's nationals or companies. Iran contended that the United States disregarded the legal personality of Iranian companies within its territory and that the U.S. majors under Section 201 sub A of TRIA Section 1610 sub G of the FSIA and Executive Order 13599 were unreasonable. The court noted that a major is unreasonable under the Treaty of Amity when it does not pursue a legitimate public purpose 
There is no appropriate relationship between the purpose pursued and major adopted, or it is manifestly excessive in relation to the purpose. Although the U.S. majors at issue might have pursued a legitimate public purpose of providing effective remedies to plaintiffs awarded damages and the attachment and execution of a liable defendant's asset is generally an appropriate relationship with that purpose. The court found the legislative measures to be manifestly excessive. It noted that TRIA and the FSIA employed very broad terms, capable of encompassing any legal entity, regardless of the degree or type of control exercised over them by Iran. The court ruled that the United States unjustly lifted the corporate veil, disregarding the separate legal personality of Iranian companies in liability judgments rendered in cases where the companies could not participate and in relation to underlying facts the companies seem to be uninvolved in. Additionally, the court found Executive Order 13599 to be manifestly excessive in relation to the purpose of responding to Iran's sustained support of terrorist acts because it applied in an over-inclusive manner to any Iranian financial institution. Article 3, Paragraph 2, on Iran's claim that the United States violated the treaty's guarantee of freedom of access to the courts and prompt an impartial justice, the court found no violation committed by the United States, although the application of law by U.S. courts was unfavorable to the Iranian companies. The ICJ noted that the rights of Iranian companies to appear before U.S. courts make legal submissions and large appeals were unimpeded. By seizing and attaching the assets of Iranian companies, the court found that the United States had committed an expropriation contrary to Article 4 of the treaty. The court only found a violation here with respect to the United States measures taken under TRIA and the FSIA, but not those enacted by Executive Order 13599. The court noted that a judicial decision attaching and executing property or interest in property does not per se constitute a taking or expropriation of that property. Instead, an element of illegality is required. After examining the various legislative, executive, and judicial acts taken by the United States, and at issue in this case, the court relied on its prior finding of unreasonableness to establish that the U.S. majors had not been a lawful exercise of regulatory powers and amounted to an expropriation without compensation. However, the court dismissed Iran's taking claims directed at Executive Order 13599 because Iran failed to identify affected property of Iranian companies specifically impacted by the executive order beyond Bank Markazi. Because the court denied jurisdiction over claims related to Bank Markazi, the court did not find the United States to have committed an unlawful expropriation with executive order 13599. On Iran's claims that the United States failed to afford the most constant protection and security to Iranian companies as provided by Article 4, the court stated that the United States' obligation under the treaty was to protect Iranian companies' property from actual physical harm. During the proceedings, Iran asserted that the treaty's obligation extended beyond protection from physical harm to legal protection of property. The courts refused to extend the protection from physical harm afforded by Article 4, Paragraph 2 to legal harm because of the overlap with the fair and equitable treatment provision in Article 4, Paragraph 1 that would result from accepting Iran's interpretation because the court already determined that the U.S. majors violated fair and equitable treatment under Article 4, Paragraph 1. It rejected Iran's claims under Article 4, Paragraph 2. The court reasoned that Paragraph 2 of Article 4 was not intended to apply to situations covered by Paragraph 1 of that article. The ICJ ruled 
that the United States did not deprive Iranian companies the right to dispose of their property. Iran's allegations were predicated on the same set of facts claimed in relation to Article 4, Paragraph 2. The court understood majors that amount to unlawful expropriation to fall outside the scope of Article 5, Paragraph 1, because the United States majors were already deemed to amount to expropriation. The court concluded that Iran had not established a violation by the United States of the right to dispose of property. Under the treaty, the United States did not improperly apply restrictions on the making of payments, remittances, and other transfers of funds. The court rejected Iran's interpretation of this provision as imposing a blanket prohibition on any restriction on the movement of capital. Instead, the court understood the provision to reflect Iran and the United States' intent to regulate exchange restrictions to preserve bilateral commerce. As Iran did not allege the United States of applying exchange restrictions, the court dismissed Iran's claims. Finally, the court found that the United States had violated its obligations to provide freedom of commerce for the Iranian companies. In the court's view, commerce applies to ancillary activities related to traditional forms of commerce, such as trade in goods. As a result, the court understood financial transactions, such as trade in intangible assets, to be commerce protected by Article X of the treaty. To find a breach under this article, the court was convinced that the United States majors were actual impediments to commerce because it comprehensively blocked property, Executive Order 13599, qualified as an actual impediment to any financial transaction conducted by Iran or Iranian financial institutions in the United States. Additionally, the attachment and execution of assets of Iranian state-owned companies under the FSIA was also considered to be an actual impediment to the performance of commercial activities by those entities. Finally, the application of both the FSIA and TRIA by U.S. courts was also considered to be a material interference with Iranian commerce within the United States. Iran requested that the ICJ, having identified certain violations of the treaty, order the United States to cease conduct that violated its treaty obligations. However, the court citing the ILC articles on state responsibility noted that it could order a cessation of internationally wrongful acts only if the violated obligation is still in force. In 2018, the United States had terminated the treaty by giving Iran advance notice of its withdrawal, and so the court determined that the relevant obligations were no longer in force and it could not grant Iran's request for an order of cessation. Finally, on the question of compensation for injuries suffered, the court recognized that the United States is obligated to compensate Iran for the violations it committed. If Iran and the United States are unable to come to an agreement on the amount within two years, the court will determine the amount due in a subsequent phase of the proceedings.